Well, good morning, WCAG. How are all our world changers this morning? Yeah, you guys excited to be here at church today? Uh, we've got some, some exciting things that are going on. I know that uh, some of you kind of, this has kind of leaked out all over the internet, but um, I just want you guys to know that we had our first launch service in Belfield, North Dakota. We set up roughly 50 chairs and 57 people showed up. We had to pull old ragtag chairs out of the basement. We filled the place, front row, uh, a dozen people, at least a dozen people, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior this Sunday. Just incredible what God's doing. Man, we, we uh, and I, I hate to even admit uh, a lack of faith. Uh, you know, we would, have been, we would have been tickled with 20 people that showed up. But man, God is just moving. There's just something incredible that God is doing. And uh, we just want to be a part of that. You know, part of what we want to do at WCAG is we want to watch what God is doing and join him, right? We don't want to do our own thing and pray that God would, would help us or, or something. But we're just watching what God is doing in that community. And so they actually, we, uh, we called an audible and we went to two services on the second Sunday in Belfield so more people could come. There were people that left the service and said to Pastor Toby, my friends were going to come this Sunday. They couldn't make it. Where are you going to put them next week? That's what they asked him. And so, uh, man, we're, we're excited to hear back the report of what God's doing at Belfield. Uh, it's just exciting. God is moving on all of our campuses, guys, including Watford City uh, here. And so we're just excited about uh, all the new people that we're welcoming to the WCAG family. And so, guys, uh, I'm really excited to share with you this morning. I want to welcome those that are joining us online today. Uh, but once a year, um, I take a Sunday to talk about a specific topic that we have talked about probably for close to 10 years. At least one Sunday a year, I, I want to speak a message because it's so important, I feel like, to the life of our church and us as Christian believers that once a year, I talk about speaking words of life. Speaking words of life. So for some people, this will simply be a review for you. If you've heard these messages, um, if, if you're new to WCAG and you've never heard this, then a lot of this may be really new material, but you are going to hear how powerful actually the words that come out of our mouth are. And normally we would jump in, uh, as we're speaking words of life, normally we would jump into Proverbs 18.21, which talks about the power of life being resident in the tongue, that, that the tongue has both the power of life and death in it. But this year we're going to start somewhere else. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. And this is how it reads in the New Living Translation. It'll be up on the screen this morning, on the bottom of the screen for those online today. It reads this way. It says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. So the first thing that we see here is the words, the heart. It says that the heart is very much involved with what comes out of our mouth. So the things that come out of our mouth, they're actually coming, the root of those things are coming from our heart. Jesus explained this in Luke chapter 6. He said, out of the abundance of the heart or the overflow of the heart, the mouth, what does it do? It speaks, right? And so we see that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, so often the things that come out of our mouth are actually showing us the condition of our hearts. And if our heart is right and pure, the Bible says that we will have the godly ability to consider what we say before we speak. But then it goes on and says something about the mouth of the wicked. How does it explain the mouth of the wicked? It says the person that has wickedness in their heart, the mouth overflows, doesn't it? It overflows. Have you ever overflowed something before? How many have ever overflowed something? Yeah, yeah, Pastor Dustin has overflowed. We see, guys, when we overflow something, what is the reaction when we overflow something? A lot of times, like, oh, oh no, oh, no. You know, like, we're, we're concerned or frantic, and, and we go, man, the reason is this is because rarely do we overflow something on purpose, right? Rarely do we overflow something on purpose. Think about that 
as it relates to this verse right here. It says, the heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. They purposefully share and allow the things to come out of their mouth, but it says the mouth of the wicked overflows. So it's like, it's not really on purpose, it just kind of flows out, it just kind of happens, and the evil words tend to overflow out of our mouth. So guys, this morning we need to begin to look at how we need to be very purposeful in what comes out of our mouth rather than being reckless with the words that we speak. Most of the time, we think carefully about what we speak, but then there are other times that we overflow out of our mouth. So let's talk about this for a second. I need some audience participation this morning. You guys up for audience participation? No, I don't need a volunteer, but thank you for that hand. I just need audience uh, participation today. I want us all, everyone, okay, if your neighbor's not doing this and you know them, Okay, this is very important. If your neighbor's not doing this and you know them, you can give them a hard time, okay? But I want us to pretend that we are all roasting marshmallows today, okay? So take your marshmallow stick in your hand. Everyone hold it, okay? And we're gonna put the marshmallow. I need to see you put it on there. Uh, two hands involved, thank you. Very good, two hands. Now we are roasting together. So hold your stick out like this. We're roasting marshmallows. And oftentimes as we're roasting, I see there's someone at the back there. You're not doing this right now, can you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there's some people looking around like somebody's not. So you got your roasting stick, we're, we're roasting, and oftentimes as you're roasting marshmallows, you are engrossed in a very exciting conversation with someone else, right? Until someone says the words, hey, your marshmallow's on fire, right? You, so your marshmallow now catches on fire. How do you react in this moment? What do you do? Show me, okay? Some people are like, they're doing the reel it in. Some people are setting the hook, you know. Others are waving the flag type thing. Yeah, I know, some of you lied. You acted like, oh, I'm so calm. I do this all the time. They're like, yeah, right. I know you're a flag waver from way back, you know. And, and, and people, when all of a sudden they, they, get, they get excited and, and they start waving and, and you're like waving around hot lava flying off into someone's wig, you know, type thing. Like that's where it's going to end up. Here's the thing, guys. When things get hot, we tend to be less calm and more reckless, don't we? When things get hot, we tend to be less calm and more reckless, especially when it comes to our mouth. What does the Bible say about this? Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 says this. It says the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. How many want to bring healing when you talk? Yeah. We do. We, want to, we, we don't want to be a reckless person that, that pierces like swords. In Proverbs 12, 18, in the, in the New Living Translation, it says, some people make cutting remarks. You know, the remarks that, that wound us and hurt us. They make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Guys, I want to encourage you to remember this point this morning, that the words that come out of our mouth are not neutral. Sometimes we walk through life thinking that the things that come out of our mouth don't really matter, but actually everything that comes out of your mouth has weight and gravity to it. It's either building up and healing and blessing, or it's tearing down and destroying and hurting. And guys, we want to be the ones that are speaking words of life. The Bible says in Proverbs 18:21 that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those that love it will eat its fruit. The scariest part about the fact of our tongue and the power that we have all been given by God is the fact that we have both the power to bring life with our tongue or to bring death with our tongue. Both of them are possible. Most of us have experienced when someone has spoken a beautiful word of life to us, but all of us have experienced someone who spoke a word of death over us, haven't we? 
Have you ever been so wounded by words that you carry them around with you for a long time? Yeah, maybe as a child, someone said something that destroyed you inside, that you maybe overheard something that you weren't supposed to and it devastated you, or maybe something was said to you in anger, in the heat of the moment, and it scarred you, and it actually still affects the way that you interact with people even today. That's the power of words, guys. That's the power. And here's the thing, though. You know, some of us, some of these words, we can still recall 15, 30, some of us even 50 years after they happen. And there's something absolutely incredibly powerful about words and the weight of the words. But here's the thing, guys. Words of death or hurting and cutting words are rarely spoken by a stranger. The words of death that are the most destructive often come from someone that we love or someone that we respect. And it's because of trust. A stranger can call you an idiot and you can just laugh in their face. It doesn't even matter, you know? Because their, their words don't carry any weight in our life. You don't trust a stranger, do you? We could easily reject those words when they're spoken. But with someone that we trust, like a friend or a loved one or a parent or someone in authority over us, maybe a coworker or a teacher or someone like that, when they speak words of death, they could cut us deeply like the reckless swords in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Guys, our goal should always be to, be, to bring healing, not be reckless. See, our words are a lot like toothpaste. Um, our words are a lot like toothpaste because we can either speak life or we can speak death. And we're going to talk about death first real quick here. If we can. Whoa, that was a big blob right there, huh? I'm not very good at this, I don't do it very often, all right? But you know what, guys, here's the thing. This is like our words right here, is once they come out of our mouth, they're very difficult to get back where they originally came from. And so if we are speaking words of death, those things, once they go out, you can't put them back. How many have ever said something and went, <gasps> Oh, I would have really liked to grab that one. I didn't mean to say that out loud. But we have to be very, very careful. The Bible tells us, one, uh, David, I think it said in Psalms, he said, God, put a guard over my mouth. That some of the things that I want to say, could you help me guard my mouth so that I'm not so loose with the most powerful tool that you have given me? That I would not be a person that once I speak these words, that all of a sudden I would regret the things that I've said. See guys, we wanna talk for just a moment about speaking words of death and we talk about in this, in this message every year, we talk about three areas that you need to be careful not to speak words of death over, okay? The first area is this, your marriage. If you're married this morning, I want to encourage you, do not to speak words of death over your marriage. Guard what comes out of your mouth when it comes to your marriage. Often, couples will come to me and they will say, Pastor Sheldon, this is our problem, this or that, and it's all of these different things. And when the reality hits, it's the simple fact that they are reaping the words of death that they have continually spoke over their marriage for many, many years. Because the Bible is very clear, guys, that whatever you sow, you will also reap. 
The Bible explains the sowing reaping principle and when we plant seeds in, a, in the ground of our marriage through the words that we speak, those will often come back and many people uh, will try and change their spouse. They go, you know what, I'm gonna use this powerful tool to change my spouse into the person that I want them to be. So I'm going to nag them, I'm going to berate them, I'm going to use a louder voice than them and all of these things, we're sowing seeds of death into our marriage and the Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. So listen, if you're in a situation like this, and guys, all of this is not, we're not sharing this information to beat anybody up today. This is information so that you can have a better marriage. And so when we look at this, what do you do if you have sown seeds of death, you've been very loose and reckless with your mouth within your marriage? I want to encourage you guys to do this. The first thing you need to do is you need to ask forgiveness of your spouse for trying to control them with your tongue, trying to control them with your mouth. And ask forgiveness and be, be legitimate about it and say, hey, th- I've been speaking these things, I've been saying these things over, over our marriage and, and I'm sorry and I don't wanna do that anymore. And then the second thing is this, guys, is begin to invest in speaking words of life into the heart of your spouse. And as you're speaking those words of life into the heart of your spouse, something is going to happen. Because the Bible talks about the sowing and reaping principle, right? Whatever you sow, you're gonna reap. This is the problem though, oftentimes I find in marriages, is people will go, I'm gonna sow, and they're like a farmer that sows his seed and gets all of the crop planted, and then the next day comes out and goes, why isn't any of this stuff growing? You know what? You're gonna have to sow, and sow, and sow, and sow, and sow. Maybe for weeks, sometimes months, maybe even into years. But the Bible says that you are guaranteed a harvest because whatever you sow, you ultimately will reap. So if you're sowing words of life, you will reap in your marriage words of life. So guys, I wanna encourage you, be very careful not to speak words of death over your marriage. The second area is this, Number two, be very, very careful not to speak words of death over your children. Now, before we jump into this, we are not talking about this so that every parent can leave church with a stomach ache today and feel rotten about themselves, okay? That's not the purpose of what we're trying to do. We are all in the same boat. More than likely, we have all spoken words that are very cutting uh, to our children, But guys, the reason why we want to talk about this is because words of death often have the greatest effect on children. But you know what's exciting to me? Is that words of life have a greater effect on children as well. Words of life have a greater effect on children. See, you don't see it as much in adults But have you ever spoke harshly or cutting to a child and then watched or someone maybe did and you watched as they kind of deflated? Like you can physically see it in a child. It's like they just go. It's like a little balloon inside of their chest, just kind of all the air just gets left out of it. You know, the Bible talks about, this is kind of like a biblical principle. In fact, many writers or Bible scholars talk about uh, the crushing of a child's spirit, that actually on the inside of that child, as words of death or harsh and sharp, reckless words are spoken to that child, that that it can actually begin to crush their spirit. In Proverbs 15.4, it actually talks about this. It says, gentle words are a tree of life. So the Bible is encouraging us to have gentle words which will be a tree of life, But then it says, a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. That when we speak over our children, things like, you're no good, you're worthless, why are you so stupid, why can't you be like so-and-so, words of crushing humiliation or even rejection. Guys, if we could be transparent for a moment within our church family here today, how many people can remember a time 
when someone spoke harshly or uh, something cutting to you as a child? How many can remember that? Remember that? Yeah. Oftentimes, and you see these memories can be very vivid. We can remember where we were, who said it. We can even remember the exact words that were said in that moment. So what do you do if you have spoken words of death or spoken reckless words over your children? This is what you need to do, guys, is you need to first repent to God. Say, God, I'm sorry for doing this. You have given me these children as my responsibility to literally speak life to and to cause them to to be a blessing, uh, not just to us as a family, a blessing to the entire world. And so God, I repent of of speaking recklessly over my children. And then guys, you need to repent to your children. You need to cancel those words of death. You need to say, you know what, I spoke harshly or I said these things, and you know what, they are not true. And you need to speak those things over them, and you need to cancel those things and pray over your children in the name of Jesus that those things would be broken off and would not uh, spread in their lives at all. And then you need to begin to spark, see, see, excuse me, start speaking words of life over your children continuously and investing and pouring that into their hearts and lives as well. So that's the second area is first our marriages, be careful not to speak words of death over our marriage, be careful not to speak words of death over our children. And the last one is interesting, the last place you need to be careful not to speak death over is yourself, is yourself. See, many people are very good at speaking words of life and encouragement to others and even other family members, and they can be some of the kindest people and the most caring people, but those people tend to be very, very hard on themselves. And the reason why we need to be careful not to speak words of death over ourselves is whatever you say about yourself is what you believe to be true. Do you struggle with negative self-talk? Things like you're saying about yourself, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm ugly, I'm stupid, I'll never be fill in the blank. These kinds of thoughts filter through your mind continually, oftentimes coming out of our mouth without us even knowing it. Maybe like self put downs or, or self jokes about our looks, about our weight, about comments like saying, well, I'm going insane, or I probably won't make it to C60, or uh, maybe, uh, you know what, I should probably just shoot myself, or something like that. I just hear people say those type of things. And guys, when we hear these type of things, we have to realize that that gauge is telling us there's something going on in our heart that we need to be very careful when these things are coming out of our mouth. We need to pay attention. You see, when we're saying those type of things, we're actually agreeing with the enemy of our soul, the devil. Jesus said in John 10.10, he said that the thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. You see, guys, the enemy of the soul loves nothing more than when you join him in speaking words of death over yourself. But Jesus says, all the enemy wants to do is steal and kill and to destroy from you. But then look what Jesus does in John chapter 10, verse 10. He said, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full, abundant life. Do you know what Jesus was doing right here? Anybody catch it? He's speaking words of life. He's speaking words of life over us. He's saying, listen, don't listen to the narrative that the enemy would want to try and put in your mind. Don't listen to that self-negative narrative. He's saying, listen, I want you, I want, I came to this earth, I came to be a part of a relationship with you so that you could have a life that is more abundant, that you could have a life and live it to the full. Jesus is speaking words of life over you. So guys, here's the thing. When we speak death over ourselves, what are we saying about God? What are we saying about, the Bible says that God created us, we were fearfully and wonderfully made by God. 
that God doesn't make junk, that everything that he makes has incredible value. In fact, God thinks that each one of you are beautiful, that you're smart, that you're fun to be around. God loves nothing more than to just spend time with you. And he just wishes that you would agree with him on these things. Guys, it's really important that we realize the power of life and death in the words that we speak. This is a powerful tool that God has given each one of us that we can either build up with it or we can tear down with it. We can encourage with it or we can discourage with it. It is our choice what comes out of our mouth. Proverbs 18, 21, it says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who eat it or those who love it will eat its fruit. You see, guys, the power is not just the power of death that we just talked about, but there's also in our lives the power of life. All right. Don't make a spelling error in front of everybody here. The power of life. You see, guys, just like death, once you speak those words, it has a powerful, long-term, lasting effect that can bring death, and you can't get it back. But this is the beautiful thing about what God is trying to show us today, is that the exact same power of once you let it out, the the exact same power is in life as well. That when we choose to speak words of life, that those things, once we send those out, we can't take them back either. That as we are spreading life to other people, that that has an incredible power as well. That guys, we didn't talk about this so that we could all feel rotten about all the bad things that we've said in our life, but that we could actually say from this point forward, I wanna be a person that speaks life, that sows life into other people. You see, with great power comes great responsibility that God has given us, that God has given us the power to bless people. He has given us the power to unlock beautiful things in the life of other people. He has given us the power to compliment people. He has given us the power to change a person's perspective about themselves or about their situation. God has even given us the power to alter the trajectory of someone else's life by speaking words of life. You see, the tongue of the wise brings healing, right? It brings healing. Guys, I want to share with you a true illustration of a young boy. I've changed the names of the situation, but this truly happened. There's a young boy named Brian, and Brian was continually told that he was a bad boy in school. Brian was like almost every third grade boy. He always was looking out the window when he was supposed to be looking up at the front of the class and the teacher. There was, every time the recess bell rang, he would cheer with delight because like, finally, I get out of here. He loved sunny days. And anytime Brian, it seemed like, was sitting in the old wooden desk, uh, his mind would begin to wander and he was always out exploring distant lands or scoring the game-winning soccer goal And no matter how hard Brian tried, he couldn't sit still. If he sat too long, his body began to vibrate. He tended to be a distraction to the other students, and he found himself outside in the hall and even at times at the principal's office because he just couldn't stay focused, and there was no way to pet up all of that third-grade energy of a little boy. Finally, he went to the principal, and the principal told him, I just need, Brian, I just need you to sit on your hands. When you're in, when you're in class, just sit on your hands so that you're not bothering other students, you're not you know, moving around and all this, and Brian would try, he would sit on his hands, but it was almost like that was rocket propulsion underneath his seat, and he would just, his little desk would just bounce almost as he sat in class. He didn't know what to do, because time after time, the teachers would send him out in the hallway, and after all of the kids had left the class, he would be asked to come back into the class, and the teachers for some time would lecture him on his bad behavior. In fact, he had gotten a nickname from the teachers as Bad Boy Brian. 
And year after year, he would wear out teacher after teacher, and, and year after year, he was placed. Finally, one year after Brian w- had gone through all of these things and been out in the hall into the principal's office so many times that he couldn't remember, couldn't keep track, and, and he got, they said, you know what, we need to put him with the strictest teacher in the school. And so that year, that year, they took and they stuck Brian in Mr. Starling's class. Mr. Starling was the, tr- the, the strictest teacher in the entire school, and they thought if anyone could tune Brian up and make this boy listen and not be a distraction, it would be Mr. Starling. Mr. Starling, on the first week of class, as Brian was sitting there, he watched as Brian would, Brian would reverberate around the classroom and, and thinking to himself, uh, you know, what is going on here? And Mr. Starling determined he was just going to watch the boy for one week without correcting him. And that's all he did, he just watched. And one day, Brian was a little extra jittery. Maybe it was his sister's birthday cake the night before, maybe it was just his little body's way of saying, I've been sitting in one position for far too long. Mr. Starling noticed bad Brian was getting a bit out of hand, and he said, Brian, with a steep, stern voice, he said, I'm gonna need to see you after class. Brian had heard this before. The words would rain down on him that he was no good, that he was a distraction, that he was a nuisance in class, that he was broken, that he was worthless as a student. But after the class cleared out that day, only Brian and Mr. Starling were left. Mr. Starling sat on the edge of his desk and folded his arms with a stern look and he said, Brian, I need you to look at me. Brian looked up at Mr. Starling and he said, The other teachers warned me that you were a bad boy and that you could not sit still and that you would cause problems in my class for the entire year. He says, I've been watching you for the first week of class and I think they're wrong. In fact, I think they're so wrong, I have a gift for you. Mr. Starling opened the top drawer of his wooden desk and pulled something out. He brought them over and softly laid them on Brian's desk. They were a brand new set of drumsticks. And he looked Brian in the eyes and he said, Brian, you're not bad. You're a drummer. (laughs) Guys, it's a true story, Brian started playing drums that summer and slowly worked through his young boy energy in class. Brian eventually graduated from high school. Do you know what he became? A professional drummer. Because one person chose to speak words of life and believe in him. One person. That's all it took in Brian's life. When everyone else was saying that he was worthless and broken and no good. All it took was one voice. To do this. One voice. To say, I don't believe all the other voices. I don't believe, I think they're lying to you. I think you have great worth, Brian. You see, guys, often we think of, when we talk about this, we think of all the negative things that we could say, and we're like, oh, we got to stay away from all those things. But think about the potential of the words of life that sit in this room today that could alter people's lives, even this week, even in the next 48 hours, the things that could come out of our mouth that could literally shift the trajectory of beautiful little boys like Brian, or a coworker, or a friend, or a family member, or someone that we could say, you know what, we believe in you, even if all the other voices say something else. You see, the Bible says that gentle words are a tree of life to people who are dying, people that are starved for words of life. The gentle words 
of the believer that could speak into their life. It says the tongue of the wise brings healing to speak against all the other voices, all of the other people. God has given us the gift, guys, of speaking words of life. Proverbs 18, 21, in the message, it says, words kill and words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. You choose. See, your life, you have the opportunity to choose every day. Every opportunity that you get to open your mouth, you get to choose. You get to choose life or death. You get to choose poison or fruit. What are you going to choose? What are you going to say? How are you going to use your voice to speak life into other people today? Why don't we have our worship team come at this time? Guys, this morning is simply a reminder of the power of the words that we speak according to the Bible. And you know what? Maybe you're here this morning and you would say, you know what, Pastor Sheldon, I'm coming to the realization that a lot of the things that come out of my life are words of death, that I'm very critis- critical, I'm very harsh, I'm very reckless with my tongue. And you know what? This is a great opportunity. The first verse that we talked about, it talked about how out of the overflow of our heart, right? So this is an opportunity as the worship team comes and we're gonna lead this last song. I would encourage you during this last song that you would say, you know what, God? I would just like you to cleanse my heart. I want to be a man or a woman that speaks words of life rather than words of death. That I want, God, my heart to be right with you. And so we come before God and we ask God to, we repent and we, we turn from those things and we ask God to pour into our heart in this moment. So the last few minutes of our service today, that we would just say, God, give our heart the correction and give us the ability to speak these words of life that we would have proper attitudes, that we would have encouraging words, that we would have encouraging tones, that we would speak words of blessing and words of healing. Could we do that today? I want to just stand, and I'm going to pray for us as a, as a congregation this morning, then we're going to go into our closing song this morning. Lord Jesus, I think all of us in this room today, God, um, recognize that there is power in the things that we say. And Father, we want to use this tool that you have given each one of us to bring life, to bring healing, to bring blessing. And so God, we're asking today that as we take this time right now to just worship you, that God, if there are things in our hearts that need to be cleansed, that need to be purified, if there are things, Lord, in the way that we use our tongue to, that is, it's speaking words of death, that God, you would bring correction in our hearts, that we would be men and women that would speak words of life and hope and healing through the power of Jesus Christ. So God, today we just turn ourselves over to you. We repent of things that we have done. We repent of things that we have said. Uh, We repent of bad attitudes, God. And we ask today, Lord, that you would help us, that you would purify us, that we would be uh, bearers of you, Lord Jesus, uh, those that would carry around the gospel and the word of truth and the word of life. And God, we're praying these things now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship together today, church.